When I hear the word mandala, I see precision, I see delicacy, I see history. The first thing that comes up is a visual image of the Tibetan tankas. I see peace, I see art, I see a reflection of sort of like the perfection of nature. These beautiful, richly painted maps of the mind, maps of the cosmos, maps of the spiritual journey. If you look at the veins of a leaf super close or the DNA of a snowflake super close, this kind of thing of where all the uh, sacred geometry exists around us. The mandala is so intricate and it contains so much. It contains an entire cosmos, an entire universe, an entire mind. That's what makes it, I think, such a, a compelling image to, to look at. Welcome to season two of Awaken, a podcast from the Rubin Museum of Art that uses art to explore the dynamic paths to enlightenment and what it means to wake up. I'm singer and songwriter Ravina Aurora, and I've been learning about the transformative power of art throughout my life. Since time immemorial, art has been used as a portal to better understand ourselves and the world around us. At the Rubin, a museum dedicated to art from the Himalayas, we believe art can inspire us on a path to awakening. And in this series, we're using a specific artwork, the mandala, to explore this journey and the emotions that accompany us on the way. With the help of many artists, the Rubin Museum created an interactive space for visitors to explore these emotions. It's called the Mandala Lab. But what is a mandala? A mandala is a guide. People from many cultures and religious traditions around the world use mandalas as maps to navigate their inner lives, including their emotions. Throughout this series, with the guidance of scientists, Buddhist teachers, writers, artists, and activists, we wrestle with five challenging emotions. Anger, pride, attachment, envy, and ignorance to help us take a new perspective on how emotions can influence our day-to-day experience and what they might be able to teach us if we get curious. In this episode, Entering the Mandala. Mandala is a Sanskrit word. Zogchen Panlap Rinpoche is a leading Buddhist teacher and one of the foremost scholars and meditation masters in the Nyingma and Kagyu schools of Tibetan Buddhism. Mandal actually comes from another Sanskrit root, which uh, which means the center. And that center actually is referring to like the core or the essence. And so the core or the essence here refers to the essence that is of the wisdom that is at the core of our consciousness. That core, the essence, is the wisdom. And that wisdom is the wisdom of awakening. And then the second syllable, la, means extracting or revealing or taking it out. And so together it is revealing or, or extracting the essence. In this inaugural episode, we introduce the mandala, better understand what it represents and how it may be used as a guide for exploring ourselves, each other, and the world. Like many Tibetan Buddhist artworks, the mandala is a visual catalyst that can lead to awakening. Writer, photographer, translator, and Buddhist monk, Mathieu Ricard. Mandala is really something that is used precisely to develop pure vision, to see all sentient beings as enlightened deities, the whole world as what we call a pure land, which is not a distant paradise to which you could go you know, with a rocket or something. Another way of picturing a mandala is to imagine you are taking a bird's eye view of a celestial palace a kind of circular floor plan, with the most important room in the very center. Around the center circle, there are four quadrants, each with a gate that faces a cardinal direction, north, south, east, and west. 
In a specific meditation, a Tibetan Buddhist might imagine themselves navigating through layers of rooms, moving from the outside in, towards the center, towards awakening. And so it is the circle of all aspects of our consciousness or emotions. Another meaning is actually the center or the core refers to the, the wisdom or the self-awareness. So there are like the four quadrants here that you can see the end and the center together makes it five. There are five primary bases, mm-hmm. what we call kleshas or emotions that are connected to that. But what do these emotions feel like? Listen to the tones, not just the words. And these might offer a sense. Anger. That's it. You're not getting a ball for a week. Pride. You do need to respect me. You know, I I, I made these choices for you. I made these choices for our family. Attachment. What was really so painful was watching his passionate attachment to his life just at the point where he was leaving it. Envy. Ooh, you know, I would be happy if you had a little bit less going for you. And ignorance. Oh, I know who these people are, and I don't like them. Now, when we become more curious about these emotions, we can see their true nature, see them for the wisdom they might bring us. So then their true nature are the five wisdoms. It's just a way to help us rediscover that. It's the true nature of things. And that's what this series is all about. Turning emotions into wisdom. It's about looking at what we often find to be difficult emotions and transforming them into their counterpoint, their wisdom. Ruth Ozeki is a Zen priest, professor, and author most recently of The Book of Form and Emptiness. A mandala, well, you know, it's a map of a journey, right? And, and a journey is something that takes place over time, right? It takes place over time and it moves through space, right? So, you know, you start a journey in one place and at one moment in time, and you travel through space over time to arrive at another you know, another place in time. And what a mandala does is it sort of compresses or almost distills space and time into a single image and a single moment. That's right. And uh, mandala is also a representation of our own true existence or representation of, our, of, of who we truly are as an awakened, completely free mind. And so mandala represents both the result as well as the path that leads us to that result. At the same time, mandala is also a representation that shows us who we have always been from the fundamental point of view. So therefore you can see mandala is the ground and mandala is the path and mandala is also the fruition. And and that's pretty cool when you think about it. The idea that space and time can be compressed into a single image, you know, that can be looked at and apprehended in a moment. But then, of course, it's not just that. Even though you can glance up and look at a mandala and see it in a flash, it really only starts to reveal itself over time again. So, in order to really see a mandala, you need to spend time with it and let the mandala unfold, you know, and and sort of open. And that's always interesting to me too, because as a maker, I mean, I I write novels and novels are a time-based medium. You don't become a good uh, car repairman without having a lot of experience. So, you know, hard work is necessary and it's good because it's, uh, you become, become enthusiastic because you see what's at the end of your efforts. You, know, you see the, the fruit in perspective, but the quick fix, uh, no, I'm sorry, but uh, I'm, I'm afraid it doesn't work. Of course, a mandala takes a long time to make. And so the, the time that the maker spends, that the painter spends painting, all of that time is, is compressed into 
that single image and then it's received by the person who's observing it who's meditating with it who's spending time with that image and then the image sort of unfolds through time over time you know to the observer as well the purpose of looking at the five emotions illustrated in the mandala is to really see the ways we can learn from our most difficult emotions and the role our sense of self plays the sense of ego sense of ego clinging or self centricity according to buddhist teaching is the root of all the emotions root of all the confusions root of all the sufferings and so therefore ego centered mind always intercepts our experience whether it is positive or negative experience our ego always intercepts and ego always kind of hijacks our experience our raw experience you know <laughs> we we may be having a wonderful experience a awakening kind of experience or we may be having a really you know a terrible experience of like anger for example or wanting to harm oneself or other but that experience usually is hijacked by ego you know so when the experience is hijacked by ego then that means that we have no chance or no time to work with that experience but we are working with something else so original experience of your anger with someone may be pretty simple actually but then when it's hijacked by ego it becomes a totally different ball game you know and now you're dealing with a hijacker plus the issue with your anger and so now you have to rescue yourself from this hijacker and so it gets more and more complicated because this hijacker has its own agendas its own troops its own power and its own game that brings in here you know so then you can see how very simple and beautiful experience can get so convoluted and so far away from its original experience when that sense of self is removed we can see the experience outside of the categories of good and bad we can see it just for what it is Matthew Ricard. So what is pure perception? Well, normally, when we see something, perceive something, think of something, whether it's people, things, we discriminate between pleasant, unpleasant, beautiful, ugly, harmonious, discordant, friend, enemy. So we have a very biased perception of reality. We superimpose things to reality. We distort reality, and that distortion is the root of ignorance that eventually leads to suffering. So, one of the goal is to bridge the gap between appearances and reality. Seeing things as they are is difficult work. We all experience a wide range of emotions, and it can be hard to know what to do with them when they come up. Neuroscientist Tracy Dennis Tawari. can offer some insight into how to shift the emotion into something that can be more helpful to us. In the mandala, this would be where we begin to learn wisdom from our emotions. It isn't age that gives us wisdom. It's awareness. So you're sitting with an emotion. The very first step is you're calling it by its name. So you just have to make the conscious effort of okay i'm going to be with this ugly feeling right now that i and i may not even know what it is yet so that's the first thing that that tuning in and then when you're tuning in i kind of think of it like a radio like when you're tuning into an emotion it's like you have a scratchy signal on your radio like you're trying to find the channel but it's like you're going and you haven't found the signal yet and so you just keep on turning the knob so that's the investigatory piece right so then okay so you've been with it you've tuned into it you've investigated it and it's only then when you have these kinds of practices that you can start to figure out okay is this useful information that the emotion is giving me and so that's the time where we shift out of 
all this investigation into what I would argue is really immersing ourselves in the present. And those of us who have spiritual practices, mindfulness practices, maybe who really love exercise, who love music, who do these things in our life that help us really anchor ourselves in the present moment. Maybe we love to take awe walks in the forest where we just admire the beauty of the world around us. Whatever it is, there's so many ways to immerse ourselves in the present. And then I'd like to think of a third and final step with using emotions, which is especially for me, because I think a lot about anxiety and how it can help us with mental health. When we take our difficult emotions, maybe it is anger, maybe, it, you know, whatever it is, and we hitch it to what is, gives us a sense of purpose and meaning in life, then that's when we can start to, to use emotions and really leverage them for, for good in our life. So, for example, maybe I'm really anxious about climate change and where we're going in this world. Well, I could just sit around and be anxious about that, or I can decide, okay, well, I'm going to be anxious about it. I'm going to try to cope with it. But the best thing I can do is to become an advocate and to become an activist in this area that is, I really care about it because it's causing me so much anxiety. I care. I have the energy to, to do something because anxiety gives me that persistence and focus and drive. So I'm going to shift it towards that. While we're learning wisdom from these difficult emotions of pride, attachment, anger, envy, and ignorance, there are mandala-like guides that can be found in our everyday lives. Other types of art can be portals for enlightenment and awakening. I used to think that my writing practice and my spiritual practice were uh, two different things. Again, Ruth Ozeki. And I was a little perplexed by that. And uh, I think I felt a little guilty about writing because it seemed like, especially novel writing, because you're just wallowing around in, in the realm of story. And aren't we supposed to be letting go of our stories? Why am I clinging to stories and, and in fact, creating new ones? I'm just, you know, perpetuating samsara here, you know, and reveling in samsara. Surely this must be a terrible problem. And recently, I don't feel that anymore at all. I, I, I feel more that, you know, that writing is what I do. And it, it's my way of expressing my spiritual practice. It is my expression of the spiritual practice that I do. And so it's no longer a problem. I, I no longer feel there's a separation there. And I think that art has always been that. You know, art, I think art has always been an expression of our spiritual practice, our spiritual yearning, our spiritual insight. It's very inspiring, right? And, and certainly a mandala is a perfect example of that. But other, I think it applies to other media as well. So I think everyone has their own way of expressing their spiritual practice. And it doesn't have to be through writing novels or writing haiku or painting mandala or painting sumie brush paintings or, or making music, you know, there, but there's so many ways of expressing our creativity because I think our creativity is very much part of who we are as spiritual beings. You know, you can wash the dishes in a way that is beautiful, you know, um, you can take a walk with your child in a way that is creative and, and beautiful. And so that's a creative expression of your, you can call it your Dharma position, your spiritual enlightenment in that moment. You know, we, we have a very, I think, sort of narrow conception of what art is, you know, it's painting, it's music, it's poetry, it's writing. But I think art can be anything that's, you know, that's beautiful. I think that's the other thing about mandala that I, I really love is the idea that the mandala really represents the interconnectedness of all things, right? Because it's held within this circle and all of the images sort of are operating in relation to all of the other elements and images. And that is, is just a very beautiful and a very powerful symbolic language as well. So I really, I really love that. Just the vast array of ways in which we are all connected is also reflecting on the nature of a mandala. 
When we come to realize how everything is connected, our minds open, our heart opens, we feel supported, and we can help others in feeling the same. Author and Buddhist teacher, Sharon Salzberg. Someone's mandala might include their circle of people, right? Their circle of friends. And something I've said repeatedly, more so with memorial services than with almost any ceremony, but at times with weddings or other things as well. Uh, When I have been at gatherings of people that have centered on an occasion in someone's life or perhaps their death, it's always amazed me, like... um, how big people's circles sometimes is. Like, I didn't know you knew people in town, you know, who you knew from bowling, or I didn't know you uh, also knit and you were part of this knitting club, and I didn't know you had a book club, and I didn't know, you know. It's often how I I sit there in these places. Like, oh, your life was so much bigger. And I was just like a little corner of it, and you had all these other arenas in which you, you met people and you cared about them and they cared about you, and... Look at that. That's such a surprise to me. And, and so it's like the sum total of all those many people and influences and relationships. That would be somebody's mandala. That would be somebody's kind of representation of their life. If you're going to put everyone's little photo, like a Zoom screen, you know, on that, on that uh, painting or something like that. I think it can it can lead us to a sense of uh, how do you say deeper appreciation of interdependence, right? Or gaining a tool to look deeper into the interconnected nature of the world, through which, of course, uh, you can't help but to have genuine sense of uh, love and compassion towards each other. And I think the mandala really again. It's a kind of distillation of that notion of interbeing, interconnectivity. I think it's also a representation of, in a way, of community too, you know. It's the community that is within that circle. And so there's this sense of a kind of representation of connection, of kinship, of sangha, right? Of of the cosmos on whatever scale that might be. There's a completeness to it. There's a, a kind of contained unity there. And, and in a way, it's, of course, idealized, too. So in that sense, it's quite inspirational. It inspires us to look at a mandala. Another function of the mandala, whether you use it literally as a mandala or not, is remembering that we're not alone, because we can feel so alone as we face adversity of some kind. But in truth, we're not alone. We're never alone. And so however however you genuinely remind yourself of that is a, a tool worth having. We all need tools to help us navigate the complex and dynamic world of our emotions. But maybe the most important tool of all is our curiosity, something we all have. Over the next few episodes, as we listen to reflections on anger, pride, envy, attachment, and ignorance. As we tune into these mind states, we can bring with us our innate curiosity and wake up to what's possible. As Sharon says, Everybody wants to be happy. And when you explore with courage, You'll feel really proud because you did it by yourself. And you come to find that the feelings you might be scared of have so much to teach you. You're holding the feeling and turning it and examining it and transforming it. And rather than be critical of our emotions like anger, we can... Learn to hold anger like a baby. You know, you hold it lightly, you hold it lightly. Ultimately... I think these conversations about difficult emotions are the single most important kind of conversation we can have right now to improve our lives. Thank you for listening to Season 2 of Awaken. You just heard Buddhist teacher and scholar Zogchen Panlap Rinpoche, psychologist and neuroscientist Tracy Dennis Tawari, Buddhist teacher and author Sharon Salzberg, Author, photographer, and Buddhist monk, Mathieu Ricard. 
Zen priest and author Ruth Ozeki, 10-year-old Nora Wood, an activist and author Adrian Marie Brown. Awaken is produced by the Rubin Museum of Art with Don Eshelman, Tenzin Gelek, Jamie Lawyer, and Christina Watson. The series is produced in collaboration with Sound Made Public, including Tanya Katenjian, Emma Vecchioni, Philip Wood, and Jeremiah Moore. Music produced by Alexis Cuadrado and Hannes Brown, with some additional tracks from Blue Dot Sessions. Awaken Season 2 is part of the Rubin Museum's Mandala Lab, a multi-year initiative generously supported by 28 donors and sponsors. Lead support is provided by the Milton and Sally Avery Arts Foundation, Barbara Bowman, the Pierre and Tana Matisse Foundation, Rasika and Girish Reddy, Shelley and Donald Rubin, and the Tiger Baron Foundation. Public funding is provided by the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council and the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of the Office of the Governor and the New York State Legislature. You can continue the conversation by following us on Instagram at at Rubin Museum. And if you're enjoying this podcast, leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts and tell your friends about the conversation you just heard. This is episode one of a seven-part series inspired by the Mandala Lab at the Rubin Museum, an immersive space for social, emotional, and ethical learning. Come explore the lab in New York City or in one of the installations that is traveling the world. To see the Vairachana Mandala, which inspired the Mandala Lab and this season of Awaken, visit rubinmuseum.org awaken. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks for listening.